uh, get started then. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us today. And uh, with Elizabeth recording this, this will also be available online. Uh, so for those students who, who can't make it, and again, I know it's always a challenge on Friday at 10 a.m. to ask if this is where you want to be versus uh, doing something else. But I guarantee you, any, any of you here or watching will, will find tremendous value in this panel today. So we're here to talk about uh, applying to academic and non-academic jobs. And what, we've, uh, what we have here is a terrific set of panelists. So we have some different names than what were listed on the original advertisement as we've shuff shuffled some things around. Uh, but collectively, we'll hear from five people today who can discuss a gamut of considerations, both for applying to academic positions as well as non-academic positions. Now, have any of you actually, are any of you in the midst of applying for anything? Okay. Just looking at opportunities. Okay. So this will be especially timely. Uh, as you go through this uh, process, uh, and, and, and there'll be plenty of time as well to ask questions, Erica. So when you, at the end, say, what about this, what about that, what should I expect, what are they going to look at when they get my application package, this is a, a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to ask questions as well. Uh, so I've asked each of, each of our panelists to take about seven minutes, but in fact, I know that means longer. Uh, but but just, uh, to, to just give kind of quick overviews of maybe some of their experiences as well as some of their tips for success in applying to academic and non-academic uh, positions. So who will we hear from uh, today? In turn, we'll start off with Dr. Lusty, who's uh, earned her PhD from UNLV in English. She's an assistant professor uh, in residence in the Honors College, but she's taught for many years in English in the Honors College, uh, but she's also dabbled in a variety of other things that allows her to comment on non-academic positions as well as academic positions. Then we'll turn it over to Dr. Chen, who is in the uh, William F. Hara College of Hotel Administration. She earned her PhD in 2009 from the University of Illinois, but she was at Temple uh, University uh, before, uh, in a faculty position before recently coming to UNLV just over a year ago. So she's successfully navigated the tenure track faculty line twice already in her distinguished. Uh, so so uh, she's run the gauntlet, which is a challenging gauntlet, but she's already done that twice. So she'll know to have some excellent tips for uh, facing that academic job market. Then we'll turn it over to Dr. Uh, uh, Venkat, who's Dean of the um, Howard Hughes College of Engineering. And one thing that has really impressed me, uh, Dr. Venkat, is uh, the work you've done connecting, especially with the engineering senior design competition, UNLV undergraduate students in industry. So he's thought deeply and done many great things linking students at UNLV with job opportunities locally. Uh, so he'll have some thoughts, I'm sure, in this vein, as well as also fostering ties with the Lee Business School to, to once again get us to think about um, how we can uh, take our, our UNLV academic experience and uh, link it to uh, business and wider uh, concerns. Uh, we then are uh, fortunate to have um, two community members who have had distinguished experiences and careers uh, thus far. So we'll hear from Dr. Lamash who got his PhD from the University of Connecticut in political science and survey research methodology. At one time, I believe you directed the Cannon Survey Center here at UNLV? A little over five years, yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, is that, he's done lots and lots of very interesting things. Uh, also earned an MBA from Cornell University. Uh, he's worked in academia at UNLV, Monmouth uh, University in New Jersey and several other places, but he's also done consulting work, including for McKinsey and Company and the Monitor Group, which is now a part of Deloitte. So he's once again, been in academia, but also non-academia, and can speak to both sides of that academic, or that, that, that job universe. And then um, last, but certainly not least, we'll hear from Vic Gill, who's done lots of interesting things as well, but he's, uh, in all these discussions about um, uh, the medical school, Nevada growing, the healthcare industry, uh, Dr. Gill is, I think, part of very important discussions. Uh, he has an MD and earned an MHA, MHA from uh, UNLV, uh, but he's a hospital administrator at UMC. Uh, so he can also speak to some of the healthcare considerations with respect to jobs, as well as also being aware of you know, some of the academic medical center uh, discussion points. So uh, an impressive set of panelists. And with that, we'll turn it over to our first, Dr. Lusty. So one of the things that applicants frequently don't realize is that it's a nine to twelve month process and that there's all sorts of prep work you should do before you start applying. Um, the application process itself can run about six months um, and you should have at least three months of prep. So what does that mean? Reading ads in your field, learning how to read them. I mean, of 
course, sometimes what is written in the ad is um, not as specific as what committees are looking for, but it gives you a feel for the language and the type of language you need to use in your cover letter to address your, your skills with the department's needs. Um, you should revamp your CV and start thinking about things you can include, like department or college service. And I actually did a ton of this stuff when I was still a graduate student, so um, it's definitely possible to get involved in panels like this, re graduate research forums, uh, being a graduate student representative on hiring committees, um, things like that. Um, advising or working with students if you teach, community outreach, um, getting involved in things your department does with the community, your technological capabilities, because even if you don't like teaching online, everything's moving that way. And the more you know how to do um, or show familiarity with is good. Um, hybrid teaching experiences. Team teaching is gaining ground in some fields. Um, and also cross-department. I know we're in honor, some of us are already talking about what we could do for the medical college with the rhetoric and literature of science. So be hearing from us <laughs> next year. Um, there's also a spring market that a lot of universities and colleges now have to wait for funding approval so they can't list job ads until they have that money, which happens in the spring. So traditionally the fall market was it, and that's, I think it's about half and half now. Um, where to look? Um, all fields have um, job lists, right? So in my field, it's the, the MLA job list. HigherEdJobs.com um, seems to be the, the default. Everybody posts on there. But I did some quick Googling, too, and um, the American Association of Applied Sciences has, has a job list in Science Mag. The American Sociology Association has a job list for it on their site. Um, a lot of specific groups, like the Modernist Studies Association, for all 300 uh, literary modernists in the US, they also post job ads in their field through their Facebook page. Um, so some, um, so there are a lot of places to look besides a traditional job list. Um, okay, and then the academic jobs wiki is a thing um, heavily sustained by people on the market. So they're able to talk about um, where the schools are in the hiring process, Sometimes they find out things about um, the committee or what the department is doing. Uh, so that's, a, a re it's really interesting to see. Um, and post by field. So uh, the American, the 20 and 21st century American literature people have their own jobs wiki. So you can check by your field too and see uh, the people on the market and the people who are writing the job ads and posting them uh, seem to be going there. A little bit on CVs and job letters. Um, they absolutely do have to be tailored. I mean, the days of the form letter are gone, and um, not to be discouraging, but there are anywhere from 300 to 1,000 candidates in humanities for English and history people. Um, 300 to 1,000 applicants per tenure track job. And tenure track jobs aren't all that are out there, right? There are a lot of teaching positions. Um, that, and actually, I have one of these now, the faculty and residents. A lot of universities are moving towards converting part-timers to full-timers for their um, accreditation ratio. So, and I don't know if you guys follow the, um, the discussion about tenure track is an outmoded uh, system, but a lot of universities are starting to hire teaching lines that are not attached to the tenure track. So that's a good way to get in. Um, also, ask your, um, no disrespect to senior faculty, but ask your younger or junior faculty who have been on the market in the last five to seven years to see a, a job letter that they used. That was probably the single most helpful thing for me, to see an actual letter um, and how, how it was tailored to a specific job ad. Um, campus interviews can be 10 hour days meeting people from all different departments. Um, sometimes you wonder why you're talking to people and I've done, 
six or seven of these. They're exhausting, so it kind of helps to know what's coming. If you get a schedule, you should Google the people and see what they work in. Um, teaching demos. Um, okay, I've done six or seven of these. Sometimes I'm surprised by the fact that they assign you a topic that is not necessarily in your field. So being able to say, okay, this is maybe not listed in their job app, their job ad, but clearly they want someone who can teach this and use, you know, visual things while teaching X. So they do usually let you know that a few weeks ahead of time, but I, I found it helpful at one point when I was on the market to just have three very different teaching demos, one for composition, one for one in my field, and then one that crossed over and used technology. So um, that came in handy. Um, also negotiating, because we just had something like this happen, uh, actually in another department, but I was um, privy to some of the things going on. Um, negotiating when you're offered a job ad, you might want to talk to people in your department and find out what acceptable um, practices are in your field. Um, for example, but uh, things like um, salary or travel funds are, are usually not negotiable, but teaching loads and someone um, was offered a position in a department and had this list of demands and the offer was withdrawn and then there was this whole conversation. So, um, so find out what people in your field are doing before, um, don't just go with something it says on a website about demand this much money because it, that doesn't always work out. Well, thank you notes. Um, civility and professionalism go a really long way. That stuff is not dead. So, um, so, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about social media because this is kind of changing um, and quickly. So, um, and there are all these discussions online about should you use social media? How can you use it for your field? Um, some of the things and I just did a quick Google search, eight reasons why academics should be on social media. If it's field appropriate, you can get involved um, in groups who are collaborating, things like developing teaching platforms, sharing research, um, being involved with the community, right, and being sort of a, a public figure. We have a couple people in English who do this with blogs, and, um, and it seems to be pretty effective. Um, but consider recent free speech flaps and the fact that nothing you put out there is deletable. Uh, there have been a couple instances of um, professors, one in Ohio and one in Illinois, I think, who were offered jobs and then had it rescinded based on past tweets. Um, so I would just get out there and look at what people are doing in your field. It's good to be um, active and to have a public persona, but you need to be very conscious of that and not comfortable with um, with what's out there. You need to be sort of vigilant. Um, Academia.edu has kind of gotten big in the last two years. It's like Facebook for academics, um, but there's no socializing. You post papers. So for example, I had two articles come out in a journal that um, has not does not have an electronic platform yet. So I was able to put citations in the top and upload those as PDFs. And I follow a couple of different, you can follow research strains, things that you're interested in, and see what people are publishing. So I follow one on Mediterranean archaeology. I follow one on um, uh, the UN and people writing about their policies in Europe and migration right now. Um, so it's a really interesting way to see what people are doing in other fields and where they cross over. And also a good way to find out about conferences, too. Uh, and then clean up and privatize your social media profiles. Um, it seems like a lot of people just don't really think they're going to be Googled, and that's the first thing search committees are doing now. They're reading blogs, they're looking at people's Pinterest pages. Um, so get, get your mom or your friend's mom to look at your pages and, and object from, um, from the perspective of someone who's realistically of an age group with search committees. 
And then I had a few things to say about the non-academic market, because as Peter mentioned, I've been um, doing all sorts of stuff, five jobs at all times. So, um, so one of the things I wanted to mention is Alt-Ac trends, alternative academic careers, which is where people with higher degrees roll over into non-teaching positions, like in archives or libraries, think tanks, nonprofits. Actually, you know, we've had a few people go over to Brookings. Um, museums, journalism, digital technology. Just as an example, I am, um, for a couple years at a local station, I was hired to come in and um, coach news anchors on how to speak more clearly and to eliminate things like that and uh, leads and stuff. And then later I um, was editing scripts for them. That was just a, a three-year side job that um, was interesting. I, I manage social media for a charity now and post stuff like that. Um, so there are a couple places you can look for alt-ac careers in your field. Um, they have a huge presence on Twitter. There's an organization that actually kind of streamlines um, other careers. Um, but there's also a, a book out called Alternative Academic Careers for Humanities Scholars. That's pretty specific um, to humanities. But there are also there's also a, there have been a spate of um, articles in the news lately about um, industry, technology industry and scientific industries um, and what they look for, why they like humanities majors, um, places like Google and, and such. Um, okay, and then some, some pros of being out of academia are that, um, and this is according to an article by Isaiah Hankel, who's a PhD who left academia, um, you, ha you actually have a bigger impact. I mean, we're actually a pretty large university, but uh, working with the community and making things happen um, more quickly than things happen in academia or in ways that you're able to see and track can be rewarding. Um, teamwork, right? If you like working with people to develop things, academics are not always wonderful at teamwork. Um, more geographic reach and opportunity, right? When you're looking for jobs, even though they tell you you have to, you have to be willing to go anywhere in the country. I was not one of those. I I lived in the South. I lived in the Midwest. I I love the weather here. I was like, I'm staying in this general area. So, um, but it's very, you know, but you're limited to, if you're in academia, you're limited to the the universities or colleges that have positions in your field. Some years, when I first went on the market, there were like eight jobs in my field. Um, and one was at Yale, and one was at Harvard, which I had no chance of getting, right? So, um, so the ability to move around more if you're more flexible. Um, compensation, right? Academia um, does not necessarily pay as well as industry jobs. And then general opportunities to um, cross fields, work with people from other disciplines. So those are some of the pros of going outside of academia. And I'm, I'm definitely at my time, so I will stop and ha be happy to expand later. <clears throat> well, thanks, Dr. Lusty. And again, we'll, we'll have each of you give your sort of overview thoughts and then plenty of time for questions and discussion. So. Uh, sure. Hi, good morning, everyone. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you, Dr. Gray, yes. for the introduction and introducing me. I just need to add one more thing. Is that I'm originally from Taiwan. I've been in this country for 15 years. So with this international background, my, um, I could only focus on the academia job positions, specifically um, research uh, institute. So my talk will be based, of course, on my experience. Again, 10-year track research university rather than teaching university just because it will be about my but how, I don't know how many of you are international students though. Um, so, um, so and now I've been, when I was at Temple University, I've been, I served at a search committee. So I saw being on, on the other side of the table interviewing people, but also I've been like interview, I was interviewed at Temple and also UNLV and a couple more other universities as well. Um, so I could tell you uh, when I was a search committee what we are looking for. So basically, if you are looking for research tenure track positions, we look for publications, teaching experience, and it's getting more and more uh, important is the grant. Whether you have 
uh, apply for the grant, and most importantly, whether you really uh, get the get the money. So um, publications, of course, um, it's more and more important. You work with your peer colleagues, your advisors, you get a good uh, good research done, good papers published in journals that certainly will put you in a very good position. You could go down your CV. And teaching, I'm not quite sure. I've been a couple of different universities. I know some, some of the universities um, teaching for the PhD students is required mandatory, but I know some they don't. So in, in any case, it doesn't matter. Just try to gain uh, teaching experience. And I mean, if, if you cannot really commit it to the entire semester, maybe you can knock on the professor's store and say, hey, if, you can, if I could be a guest lecturer, one section here and there, just something that you can put on your CV, that would be great in terms of getting teaching experience. And grants, and I understand that being a graduate student might be a little bit difficult, but uh, there's always opportunities for internal grants, which is much easier uh, to apply. So again, just try, I know it sometimes be hard, again, depending on which discipline you are, but like I said, um, publications, teaching, and grants. Most important thing in my mind is to attend conference. I think that is the great opportunity really to meet people. So talking about back to the publications, right? So you write, write papers and you must cite some other people's articles, scholars' articles. So try to make sure to try to find out what's their name, where they are from, and most likely you will meet these people at the conferences. So just just don't be shy, approach them, say, hey, I have cited, I've read your articles, I have cited your article. In, in my paper, right? So that's a way to um, kind of approach to other people. If you know one, they can introduce you uh, to, to, to these uh, people. And um, so, like I said, attend the conference. Um, my, my strategy is that I usually go to two conferences per year, and one, I would go to the conferences where I know my friends or my colleagues, my friends would go. The other one, I always choose one conference that I know for sure there's nobody that I know will attend the conference. So in that conference, I have no choice, but I really have to approach other strangers to force myself, even though I'm shy, really, but I will still like, force myself to meet new people. And actually, that works even better than, I, than uh, the, the old conferences that I usually attend. Just, again, I knew people, and, then, and, and I cannot end up working with new, this new fellows for a couple of new articles. So that would be something that I encourage you to do. So again, you, you, it's still very important to keep your old network, but in the meantime, I think getting to new people is also very important. So if, if your budget allows, I would encourage you to do this. Just one stay with your own, own yes, your comfort zone, and the other one is trying to reach out to the new environment. And uh, also when you uh, attend a conference, even though the conference is hosted in like the fabulous resorts, like the uh, Hawaii, the, 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 the island where you are very attempted to go outside, but I still encourage you to, you to stay for the entire sections. Again, first of all, to, to show that you are professional, right? You respect, you, you respect other people, you, you committed to the conference, so you stay for the entire section. If you want to go out and fun, just do it after the conference. So, so it's, again, just to make sure that people see your faces, I think that's also important, so people know you better, if, you, if they don't know you by your names. But at least those other people see you around, and then they could just um, increase your, how do I say that? Just that like it will have you uh, better images in other people's um, eyes. Um, and also when you are at a conference, um, invite people to go to your presentations, if you have presentations, so ask them to, to come, stop by, give you feedback. And I always think that is the best part, is that you have the Q&A section. The presentation itself is nothing. Everybody can always read your articles, right? And your presentation itself is okay, but the most fun part in my mind is that, the discussion. So again, just be open for all kinds of suggestions, recommendations, and then you, you never know. Um, so to sum up, I think there are two things I would like to, uh, it's again from my own experience, is that just don't limit yourself. Again, when you apply for the job, um, I would say try to apply for all the universities that you, you think you can fit. 
don't limit yourself. So say, oh, you have to stay in the U.S. or you have to be in certain part of the country. I understand everybody has your own your own background, maybe family issues, etc. But when you apply, you might get the um, interview opportunities, and there might be a good chance actually, good opportunities for you to practice anyhow. So good, of course, I'm, there are other I mean, ethical issues here. But just saying that, try don't don't limit yourself. At the same time, it takes time. So if you did not make it this year, just be patient. It will come, but just the time will come. But just again, do your best. Like I mentioned before, publications, teaching, grants, conferences, and uh, in my mind, that they will they will put you in a very good position. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. So I'll turn it over to Dean Beckett. All right, uh, I interviewed for a job, faculty position at UNLV. 1989. So I've stayed on this job for 26 years. And I've grown from an assistant professor to associate to chair, director of a building, and finally the dean of the college. So I interviewed just last year for the position of dean. Uh, that's the, that's, those are the only two interviews I've done, um, and both of them successfully, luckily for me. Uh, so my experience from your side is very limited, but I have a lot of experience from the other side interviewing people. I've, interview, I've probably interviewed uh, hundreds of people for faculty positions as chair, as dean, uh, as uh, for, for, for professional positions, associate deans. I mean, interviewed a lot of different people for different positions. So I'm going to give you my perspective on uh, more from an interviewer uh, perspective. Uh, and also, I thought about it uh, last night when I was thinking about it. I, I, I thought that I was split it into three pieces long before your interview, that is during your graduate studies or undergraduate studies, what you should be doing because you can't suddenly have a great CV or a resume the day before the interview. It's not going to happen. you got to build it. So I'm going to talk about some of that. And then just before the interview, what you need to do, focus on the particular job. Then during the interview, what do you do? And after the interview, what do you do? So that's the way I split it. I, I thought it, it gives us a way to present this. The first thing I would say is that in school, do well. Don't think that, oh, they don't like 4.0s, they only like 2.5s, so there are nuts, no such thing. Do well in school. And I don't mean just in, uh, in uh, doing courses and doing well in courses, that's important. Do as many projects as possible. As many, if you're an engineer or a scientist, do as many hands-on projects as possible. Because those are all things that people like to see, that you've gotten involved in a project. You're involved in a cross-disciplinary project. You work with, a, as an engineer, you work with a business school person, or you work with a scientist. So people like to see that. Because in a, in a job environment, even in the academic environment, you, you have to work with people. You work in committees, you work on projects together. Especially in an industry, an engineer works with an economist or a psychologist. So working together where there is opportunity through, through curriculum, through extracurricular opportunities, I encourage that. Don't be just say, oh, I'm, I'm a civil engineer or an electrical engineer, I'm just going to do that. That doesn't cut it anymore. And uh, professional society, actually my college, uh, probably Erica can vouch for this, civil engineering uh, has probably one of the best professional uh, student organization. They have nine membership positions for which people fight. That's how competitive this is. Uh, they are very good. They generate about forty, fifty thousand dollars worth of money every day, by the, every every year by themselves, by selling fireworks and this and that. But what it does is that if you are part of that group, you develop interpersonal skills, you develop leadership skills, you know how to talk to people, how to. Uh, so you show that you can lead a team. So when pe when you go out and ask for money from uh, 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 from a company and you say we are going to go to a professional organization, I'm taking 40 people with me, people see that, ah, this guy is a leader. Actually, there are several examples from civil engineering society who have found great job. They may not be academically great, but because of this training, they have done extremely well. So getting involved in the professional societies, not for putting it on the resume saying that I was chairman, get involved, do stuff. Because when you do an interview, when they ask you a question, you may be able to relate to an experience from the professional society. People like to hear that. People don't just deal and, and say, okay, oh, you did well in school, you published three, four, four journal articles, I'm gonna give you a job. If they see this additional stuff that you did with others, that's something that adds to your resume. You wanna stand out from the rest of the crowd. How do you do that? And uh, community projects are always great. 
and for engineering students, I have to say this, right? Communication skills, it's very important. Presentation skills are extremely important. Not just reading from a PowerPoint, right? Reading from, a, uh, most students do that. Uh, typically, you would see that. You gotta have a couple of bullets there, but you need to be able to verbalize and add ideas and expand on it. And, and be able to answer questions when you are making a presentation. That's very, very important. And a lot of times students just uh, worry about that. I, I suggest for engineering uh, students to go to Toastmasters or any place where, or, or take a communications class. Nothing wrong, actually, I sat through a communication presentation from, I think it's Communication 101. Some incredible presentation from all kinds of students. It's a, it's a good way to train. Don't be shy. Actually, being shy doesn't get you anything, right? Go shake hands where you can. If you go to meetings, shake hands. Don't just stay with your group. It's not really, it's good for that time being, but it's not going to help you in the future. You need to expand your horizons and meet a lot more people. And working with professors and alumni, not just your own major professor with whom you're doing thesis or dissertation, working with other people on projects and getting to know alumni. Because many of the alumni, actually, for you and this is a very special distinction. 60% of our alumni, which is probably 60 to 70,000 people, UNRV has graduated about 100,000 people till now, they all are in Las Vegas. So getting to know them is very good because some of them are owners of big companies. They're holding CEO, CFO type of positions. Getting to know them and going to the alumni mixture, those kinds of things is a good thing to do. And uh, any workshop related to interview skills, mock interview, actually College of Engineering runs mock interview skill uh, training uh, at least two to three times a year. Go to those things. We bring in industry partners and alumni to, to train students how to prepare resumes or how to present yourself in, a, in an interview setting. Because first time going to an interview is scary, so it's better to just get used to that. And social media, I think you pointed out, is very, very important. I'm telling you, though, I think we all put a lot of stuff on the social media. What you tweet will come back to you. So be careful what you say, because a lot of the employers are starting to look at Facebooks and LinkedIn's and See what you put in there. And if you say something controversy and it doesn't go well with the company, you're not gonna, gonna get, a, get an interview. Actually, you pointed out that a couple of people have lost jobs after the, uh, uh, the award was made. So that's something that one needs to be careful. With respect to the teaching jobs uh, with, uh, in the, the academic world, I, I, I think this is something which is a problem with the, the university system. We need to fix it. I tried to fix it, but it's not easy to fix. If you are interested in teaching jobs, you need to be trained as a teacher. Presenting in conferences, don't cut it. Teaching, understanding pedagogy, what makes sense? What would make sense to millennials? How do you relate to them? What is an effective way to teach? It cannot be learned from just making a presentation at a conference. I was thrown into teaching. I, the first couple of years was rough. You look at the teaching evaluation, the student writes, uh, Dr. Venkat, you're a great teacher, but you're talking to one side of the class. Nobody told me that before. I think that training comes by going and taking a class on pedagogy in the College of Education. I think College of, I think UNRV should offer a course for all PhD students interested in going into ac academics, a pedagogy class. A, a real pedagogy class, not only you learn the theory of education, come back and, and teach under a professor. If, I, if I'm your, uh, Erika's uh, professor, I want to watch Erika teach in the class. I think that type of training and putting it on a transcript saying that I taught a real class. I made the syllabus. I made the test and graded the test. And showing that you did very well in that would really, really help. I think university, all universities should do that. I think UNLV can really do I, We did that for students in engineering uh, uh, with the College of Education. About 10 students took it. They all loved it. But we need to continue that. And then uh, with your professor, tell them I want to publish journal articles. A lot of professors who to delay it and and they may not send you to conference, push them to send you to conferences. It's important that you go to conferences, uh, very important. All right, that's uh, about how you prepare your resume, right? You're preparing materials, you have, you're preparing what to put on the material. Just before the interview, always carry a nice portfolio. And in the portfolio, typically I like to take a resume or a CV, sample of your work. If you have journal articles published, take, take them uh, with you, and a notepad and a pen and a pencil. Dress professionally, it's very important. I'm telling you, I've seen people who come to interview not dress professionally at all. Uh, that's a turn off right away, right? They say you don't want people to do that. 
and don't go late to the interview. Don't ever do that. That's not going to cut it. That's not going to be good. It's not professional. People are not going to respect that. And then uh, before you go to the interview, I would study the company a lot. Whatever Google search I can do, Wikipedia, whatever I can do, I'll read up on them. What, the, what is the culture? What is their market? Uh, what type of... Uh, Zappos is a very unique culture than Google. It's good to understand that culture. I'm not saying that you should fake to, to fit into that culture, but it's good to know the culture so that you don't say something offensive, something wrong. So that's, that's important. And uh, I, when I went for interviews, I studied geography quite a bit. Whatever climate it is, whatever weather it is that day, I, I go prepared for that. It's a good thing to do. Because you don't want to go to Florida, but you know that it's going to rain that day and you don't have an umbrella. And, and you don't want to get wet and your, your uh, dress or suit gets uh, messed up. And then, uh, typically on an interview, I've always seen this. Uh, this is it's not a trick question. They always ask you, what is your strength? What's your weakness? Uh, you don't want to fumble on those things. Which means that you have not self-reflected. You have not thought about your what is what are you good at. It's good to think about it. I'm not saying you need to kind up something fake. Think about what's your strength. Be honest about it. Because in an interview, you've got to be yourself. You can't fake it and, and get through it. It's not going to uh, work out. So, and also people ask about ethical dilemmas. Actually, if you're looking for a professional position, they say, give me an example of you're in an ethical dilemma. How, you, how did you handle it? Think about a situation that you have handled and present it really well. And then during the interview, these are things that I see that with, uh, especially with engineering uh, students. The handshake has to be firm. It's got to be a good handshake. Don't hurt somebody's hand, but I'm just saying good <laughs> handshake. And, and eye contact is very important because that shows that you're really confident uh, when, you're, uh, when you're talking to people. And phone should be cut off completely, not on vibrate mode, none of that. Because I know when it vibrates, we look around there. Right? It's not a good thing to do. Just cut it off. It's, not, it's a good thing to do. And then when people ask questions, as best as you can, give them a brief good answer. Think about it. Take a, take, take a minute to come up with your answer, present it really well. And uh, of course, we all have negatives, right? Always present them in the best possible light. Uh, don't have to not say it, but say it in a present possible way. And words like problem are not good. Words like challenges are good. Problem should be substituted with challenge. It's a challenge, but I can handle it. Oh my God, it's a problem. They don't like to hear that, right? So those are things that you have to be careful. It's not easy because we are used to conversationally, we are used to certain words. But those are things that you, you can pay uh, attention to. And uh, take time to answer questions. You don't have to rush. And when people are talking, don't interrupt them. Listen carefully, give them time, and then answer. I, I see that with people do that. They jump because they know the answer, they jump on it. But don't do that. And when you're done with the interview process, definitely uh, shake hands. And um, what else did I write here? And anytime you, in engineering, and uh, especially in engineering, uh, faculty position jobs, or uh, especially in the industry jobs, they may ask you very technical questions. Pull out the pad and pencil and draw a picture, or explain things using, using drawing or equations. There's nothing wrong in it. That, that shows that you have the depth of knowledge. There's so nothing wrong with that at all. And then after the interview, of course, thank you notes are so important. You ha always have to do that. And if you remember something in the particular interview, and don't write a generic thank you. If there is something happened to that particular person you talked about, uh, baseball or basketball, verify that. It's a state that saying, that, yeah, we did that. That was enjoyable. State that. That's a good way to re interact and uh, relate to that person. And then when the offer comes, please read it, understand it. Some of them are legal documents. Uh, there will be things about benefits and stock options and how do you get vested. So it's good to understand these words. Uh, if you're married, think about child, child care facilities. All of that is good to, is good to think about. Uh, of, of course, you don't want to go aggressively and say, I need this, 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 otherwise I don't want the job. You tell them, are these possibilities? Is there any way we can accommodate that? I would like childcare facilities. Is there anybody who's facing this problem? Can you help me with that? People are willing to always help. If they really like your background, they're going to bend over backwards to help you. The issue is really how you present it. If you demand, it's not going to happen. But you request, it may happen. So that's what I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Lush? All right. Um,
since we heard a lot about academic interviews, I think I've started at least with the non-academic part. Since, um, as you heard, I have worked in both. Um, I am well, probably one of only 10 people last year who voluntarily gave up a tenure track position simply for health reasons, since many of you are uh, in health. I'm on about 50 milligrams of morphine right now to sit here. So that's why I'm currently actually not working at all. Came back here for the weather hoping it would help. But um, <coughs> let me quickly start about talking about my work at McKinsey and uh, starting from an MBA because it's a professional school. It's a somewhat similar situation. Um, I always tell people MBA, you need to know, it stands for mediocre but arrogant. Um, <laughs> and that is the one thing you learn in a business school is how to apply, how your resume has to look like, how your interviewing skills are, uh, mixers with companies. I remember maybe, I don't know, half my accounting class, but I remember all these things that they taught me from the handshake to how to interact, how to look in an interview. And they literally had, for example, people come in uh, at Cornell to tape us and just give us feedback on how we look in an interview and how our body language um, was good or bad in an interview and how we have to improve that, on that. So these are a couple of things I said where you learn a lot. And then I was also in a similar position um, that it, at McKinsey you have to pick a service field. As, other than being a consultant, you have a service field and I picked recruiting and hiring. And so I did actually read a lot of resumes and so I can sort of look at it from both sides a little bit. So first of all, the big difference between the CVs that we talked about, my CV is about, I don't know, 22 pages. My resume is now on page two. If you are under 30, you should still fit it on one page. The reason, very simple, for example, at McKinsey, um, about 1% of resumes go beyond human resources to actually somebody in the company. 99% get sorted out by human resources already. That 1% I would get on a Friday at like 1 o'clock, I would get about 100 resumes, and I had about 90 minutes to pick my 10 candidates out of those 100 resumes. So a resume gets between 20 and 45 seconds. So one of the things that helps is they organize the resumes for us. One of the things you should know by that, for example, is don't get too fancy. Like McKinsey and many other companies use software to scan in your resume so that every resume looks the same. So I find the GPA in the same corner, I find the uh, um, your GMAT scores, your MCAT scores, and so on in the same corner, so it's easier for them. One of the downsides of that program that a lot of people um, use is if there's a vertical line on it, it reads it as a new resume. So, for example, if you put in five nice lines and it looked great when you handed it in, I got five pages. I just told you I had 45 seconds. Five pages? I don't read. Sorry, you're out. Next. So be careful with things like being too fancy. Pick a normal font. Don't get like an Arial. Pick a Times New Roman, something like that. No boxes, no lines, no things like that. Because again, if companies use scanning software, they are often get confused by things like that. So that's just a very low thing on like how to do them. Um, how to do your resume. Number one is of course your education. Um, and I can't agree more, it needs to be more than the classes you take. Um, your, I don't know, the head delegate at Model UN and you won an award, that needs to be on there because it's leadership. You were the, uh, I don't know, 
head of your gra of the graduate student association. That needs to be on there. It's leadership. The other thing you need to be on, it needs to be on there when you put these things on there is quantitatively. Like so, you were the head delegate of two other people. It doesn't sound so good. So make clear that if you were the head delegate of Model UN and you had there were nine people, that you put in that there were nine people on your team. So they see how much leadership it is. If you got a grant, make sure you put in how much money the grant was for. So people actually see what, again, it's all about. So they can quantify it and not just read that you got a grant. Well, was one for a hundred bucks and a bus ticket? Or did you really get a huge one? So that's why it's very important to quantify that. General rule, and I always say, if your GPA is under 3.3, uh, three, don't mention it. Um, that's probably roughly the line. Graduate school GPAs, 3.5 and over. Otherwise, don't mention it. Um, because you're probably better off not getting sorted out. Every company has that nice little line, we look at your resume holistically, blah, blah, blah. No. There is no holistically looking. There's a formula. And uh, the formula in most companies is your GPA times your whatever, SAT score, whatever, whatever. And if you don't meet a certain minimum, Again, I don't get your resume. That's how we got from, again, I got one resume out of every 100. That was sorted out by a secretary. She typed in a formula. And again, if you look at McKinsey's website, there will be nothing on there that there are minimum GPAs. It will tell you, we look at every resume, and again and again, no. Simply not true. So try to get around it. If it just didn't go so well with your grades, Try to figure it out. Try to put it on your cover letter. That's the other thing I always say. The cover letter is still important when you apply to a private firm. And on that cover letter, you can put in that, you know what, I not only, and I know this is having taught at UNLV for five and a half years, half of you probably have full-time jobs, which is unusual for other colleges. So make that clear, make that clear that you are not a full-time student and it took you six years to get your undergraduate degree because you were a full-time student and you just liked your fraternity or your sorority a little bit too much. So again, these things can go into a cover letter, they can go a little bit on a resume. Your work experience, similar thing. Put out everything that you worked at that looks good, again, that shows leadership. And if it was being the manager at Jamba Juice, that's fine. If you manage six people and you had, I don't know, $500,000 worth of revenue, somebody gave you responsibility. That's an important line, even though that's probably not what you want to do. But again, it's an important line. If there are numbers and you have managed people, I want to see that on your resume. I want to see that and see what you have done when you had a job on the side. Last part of the um, resume is skills and other. Skills, really only put on skills that are special. If I read that you're really good in PowerPoint, hey, I'm sorry, in uh, Office Word, yeah, that I expect from a ninth grader. So um, that's not what I need to read anymore. If you are a PowerPoint expert, if you're really good at Excel, that still counts for something because not everybody can do that. And then the last part is other. And that's what I always call the uh, Minnesota Airport Test. Do you want to stay stuck with that person for five hours being snowed in at the Minnesota Airport? And so put a few things down that you do in your life. You run a marathon. You, I don't know, play softball. You do something, like have something interesting on there where you can connect with that person. Also, on the interview part of it, that's a great filler for the interview. 
because sometimes, and even in a good running interview, you're sort of done after 10 or 15 minutes. And then that's when I look at that last part, I said, okay, how did I film my last three minutes? Oh, you also like basketball. Let's talk about X, Y, Z. So that's why this section can also be really important in your resume. I don't have to add too much. I think I agree with everything you said on uh, how to conduct an interview. And it's not that much different in a company than it is in academia other than length. Um, I interviewed at Stanford. That was a four-day interview. I think I've never had done that before. Um, the longest uh, private interview I ever had was two days. So I think that's the biggest difference. But that's, I think, the one thing um, about interviews where they differ. The one thing I want to add to the interview is also it starts when you walk in. Be nice to the receptionist. Be nice to whoever you meet first. I have never had a candidate when the receptionist told me that guy was incredibly rude to me when he came in that I haven't blackballed in the interview process later. Because that usually is not a good sign. If they just treat people nicely that are high up, um, that's not usually good character-wise. So again, if you don't treat the receptionist nicely, it probably comes back to haunt you. So really, that's where your interview starts and stops. Same with, be careful what you talk about at lunch. Yes, it's a little bit more relaxed. They will probably order liquor. We always dread that. Everybody drank a little to see what happens. Um, believe it or not, it's a thing. So be careful what you do, know your limits. And I have the last part I want to go in, and then I don't want to take up too much time, I'm happy to do Q&A, is social media. And there's a couple of things I want to say about that. Um, number one, LinkedIn. Very important to be on there. It's a purely professional site. So this is not where you put your uh, vacation pictures. This is where you put your resume, but that's one you really want to be on. It's in almost every field, and it's important. Second of all, if I would say if you are under 25, 28, and you don't have a Facebook page, I assume you deleted it three days earlier because there was too much on it that you don't want me to see. So I generally say, generally say you should have a Facebook page. Also, make it real. Like I taught at Monmouth, we are two miles from the beach. It's perfectly okay on a Facebook site to have a beach picture on there. Because I had a student on there, there wasn't a single picture on there where he wasn't wearing a suit. I said, that's not a Facebook site. Everybody knows that's a fake one. Everybody knows you have a second one where you share your real pictures. So try to mix it a little bit. Try to make it real. The only things you I would really be careful about is, of course, anything that's partisan, anything religious. Be careful with these things. I uh, would not do that. Third, alcohol, particularly if you can figure out from your website how old you are. And there are 16 pictures of you with a beer in your hand when you're 19. Not a good idea. So these things need to go. But again, you sitting on a beach, probably modestly dressed, um, is a perfectly fine picture because it's a Facebook page. And it should look real. So these are, again, more like a little bit here, a little bit there. I'm happy to answer any other questions that you might have. Well, thank you, and I'll uh, now hand it over to Dr. Gill. Well, I guess it's nice being uh, last because a lot of the, a lot of the good good things that everybody needed to hear, I think, were heard. Uh, once again, I appreciate the introduction. I'm Vic Gill. I'm the assistant hospital administrator at UMC, and it's exciting to be back here at UNLV. I graduated with my master's in healthcare administration here from UNLV, and there's a lot of exciting things. The hospital and the new medical school are going to be part of uh, part of. And if anybody has any specific questions on healthcare that might be a little bit in my uh, uh, wheelhouse, so to speak. 
I'd like to start, I think a lot of really good things were talked about um, in regards to the process, um, the, uh, the, the resume, the interview, what you do. I think generally, and I, and I don't want to be um, preaching here, but I come from a perspective of where I did go to medical school and then realized I didn't want to practice. Um, but I had a passion for healthcare. Um, so I think the big question that everybody should always think about as an undergraduate or graduate, where do you want to be in your life, in a big picture? Um, and, and we talk about a lot of small things, but where, what, what, the, what is the field? A lot of people get certain undergraduate degrees and get graduate degrees and maybe doctoral degrees, um, and their path changes. But answer that question. That's a self-reflective aspect of this process. Um, you know, if you see people, uh, what intrigues you? Um, I, I'm a firm believer that it's not the job or the title, it's the passion that makes you successful. And so find that passion first and foremost. Um, you know, with that, I think you're, you're, you're going to, uh, you'll have to go get the requisite uh, degrees uh, for that particular position. So grades, as mentioned earlier, are very important. Um, I think one thing that was maybe touched upon is um, there are professional memberships, and now in a day and age where there's more growing organizations, there's particular certifications you can get. Um, if you go into these professional memberships and you do certain exams, um, for example, in healthcare, there's American College of Healthcare Executives, and you can become a fellow. It's a way in which you just slightly distinguish yourself from other people with similar background, academic backgrounds. Um, I, I would also say, I think, in that pre-application side of things, I think Dr. Van Kat went through a little bit of the same way that I think about it before you apply. I think research the market. If you're in graduate school and, and you're a, a semester away, two semesters away, start looking at, at least I know in the, um, uh, the non-academic uh, field, jobs move, move fast. And so sometimes you're able to see something and see what the, you know, if you want to go to a particular area or you want to stay here in Las Vegas, look at the market before. Um, for, for a good year and see what, what are they posting, what are they requiring, what are the preferred um, qualifications, what are the required uh, aspects of those jobs so that if uh, when the time comes and you graduate you're ready to kind of hit the ground running. Um, I, would, I would make one point in that aspect too is there's a lot of internships. Part of the graduate school experience is internships. If you have a particular passion for an organization, um, look at doing an internship as part of your graduate school at that organization. <coughs> UMC, we have internships um, for uh, UNLV students, and, and it's a great way to get your face in front of the people who ultimately you may be interviewing with. Um, I think in the uh, non-academic field, I think earlier I mentioned the different websites. I think, you know, there's standard, the Indeed, Monster. Um, LinkedIn is a great way to build that network um, and understand you know, jobs are now posted on LinkedIn uh, in the uh, private sector uh, or the non-academic sector. And don't hesitate to actually go to the company websites if you have particular um, uh, particular companies you're looking at because sometimes there's a lag. They go on the company website first and then maybe they filter down into these other websites later. So keep an eye, and I think that's doing the due diligence process on your end. Know what you have to do and keep that eye out before you get to that point of hitting the job market and you have the degree. Um, as I mentioned earlier, jobs in the non-academic field, they move fast. I know in the healthcare industry here, you can apply for a job and, and get a response. We want to give you a response that same day in regards to an interview. Um, get you in as quick as possible because it is a very competitive market. Um, and so sometimes, you know, there's hospitals who actually have job offers without an interview because in at least healthcare, there's such a demand for people within healthcare. Um, and that may exist as well. And so I think that may be the difference if you think academic versus non-academic. Maybe non-academic, it moves quicker. So just have that in the back of your mind. Um, you know, I think there was, you know, and I'm not going to rehash what was said, but I think, you know, really focus on your resume. I think uh, we just said earlier that when if it gets to somebody's desk that is going to actually potentially interview you or be part of your team, they're going to look at your resume maybe for a minute. And it's, it's just like how we all have it, and you want to have it clear, have it easy where somebody can maybe do the one minute glance and really get an idea of who you are. So if you have that quick glance, what do you really want that person to know about you? Um, sometimes, and this is my preference, I think a cover letter doesn't hurt. It's the narrative. And, and it should also be no less than, uh, no more than a page, and, and maybe, you know, maybe a three quarters of a page where you introduce yourself. It gives you that you know, in this very sometimes uh, impersonal world of electronics and, and postings, somebody gets a, an idea of who you are. Um, it gives you uh, the interest, why you're interested in that job specifically. Um, you know, the interview, I think, was once again, we, we talked through a lot of the different aspects of the interview. 
the interview starts was just mentioned starts from the day you, from the moment you walk into that building. Um, uh, it's a lot of the things that I wanted to say were taken, but yet the receptionist. You know, when I'm when I'm in the office, I always like to ask what the receptionist thought of the, of the individual as they sat in the waiting room. Were they nice? Did they talk to them? Did they say hello? Did they say have a great day? Because that is indicative of who they're going to be when they work with you. Um, you know, when you go in, I also think uh, dressing is important. It's always better to be overdressed than underdressed. Um, you know, so you know, always keep that in in mind. I think always bring your resume with you, a copy of it, printed on good paper. You know, I remember I I, I kind of had that in my background when I met somebody who did that, and I did that whenever I went, and everybody was like, oh, wow, it's great paper. It's just paper. But they're like, this is really great paper. You know, it's a heavy stock paper. So it's the idea, not so much that you did that, but it's a little bit that you take pride in what you do in your work. So people extrapolate off these sort of things. It's not how you dress, because people don't want to just say, oh, he's a nice dressed uh, man or woman. They want somebody who's going to be professional. They can represent the organization wherever they go. Um, you know, I think one thing I'd like to add is if you have the ability to know who you interview with, do your research on them the same way they're going to do the research on you. Um, people have their own LinkedIn profiles. They may have, uh, you know, you can search them as well, and then you get an idea of who they are. Because in an interview, as much as we may think it's formal, it you want to turn it into a conversation. And if you do that, I think that's a successful interview where you didn't feel like it was the person asking you questions or you were... You know, they gave you that one moment, do you have any questions? It was a conversation. So really try to get to know who that person is before you walk in the room. I think that, that helps. Um, and, and then you, obviously, I think when you, um, there are some standard things I think you should, you should do. Research the organization was mentioned earlier. Have that question. Every interview is going to ask you, do you have any questions for me? That's your opportunity to show them. You know, don't ask the questions that anybody could have Googled. You know, take that information and then apply it to a, a something bigger. Um, you know, maybe ask about where the company's going or, you know, you read something, did, you know, did, does it mean this or does it mean this? And I think that's an opportunity for you to show that person how uh, engaging you are, the research you do. Um, I think following up uh, kind of in this digital age, sometimes following up with a handwritten letter uh, is important. Um, I, I always did that and I mean, even when I write, I'm, I'm in the digital age, um, but I write all my thank you letters. I try to write them by hand. And, 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 you know, sometimes it's not feasible. You have to send some by email, but I like to do things by, by hand. It's amazing how that little thing that you do goes a long way. Because think about yourself if somebody wrote you a thank you letter and just left it on your desk. It's a great thing. And sometimes in this very objective world where we're looking at numbers and, and, and all these sort of things and to getting down to, we're hiring an individual, and that sometimes comes down and culminates that it's just a subjective thing. It's amazing how the biggest decisions in the world aren't really calculated, but they're just a gut. So, you know, always keep that in mind as well. Um, and I think I'd like to finish with this, don't get discouraged. If you don't get the job, that's not a, that's not a bad thing. Maybe it wasn't the right fit. Um, you know, some people are able to get that job that they wanted, it's a perfect fit in the beginning. But sometimes it's about trial and error. So don't get discouraged. Start the process. Continue to research the websites. Find that position. The position that fits you will come up. It's just a matter of you not losing that kind of uh, that faith that's going to happen. And I think uh, you know that I'll kind of finish up. But I think it's, it's I'm proud to be here. If there's questions you have for any of us, I think we're ready to answer them. But uh, yeah, good luck. And I think that's the biggest thing is that you understand where you want to go. Don't lose faith that you'll ever, that you'll ever get there, and you'll be you'll, you'll be fine. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for <laughs> so questions. I have a question. How did you go from say I, I'm getting my master's and I don't want to go straight into a PhD program? How would I go from being in the field to teaching eventually? I don't know what that timeline would look like. You said you were a journalism major? Yes. Um, I'm sorry, were you addressing yes. this to me? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are a couple of different ways you could get experience teaching journalism. One is on the high school level. I did four years in a private high school. Um, and I learned, I learned a lot about my teaching style. Um, the kids were good. I didn't care for the way the school was run. 
Um, but so high school community centers, like working with um, library district or continuing ed, frequently offer courses um, at community college. You only need an MA, and uh, and they're heavily staffed by PTIs. So, um, and that that's not the this nightmare three day interview part. That that's not the case for PTIs. So, I would check that out. Um, every single station in town has internship opportunities. I would see um, what sort of actual field experience you could get. That um, because a, a lot of Everything I did in the stations here for three years, four years, was just um, meeting people and having them say, oh, hey, can you, you know, have you ever done this? Do you want to kind of try doing this? So just meeting people, um, or at the, the RJ and the Sun, uh, and, and because when something comes up, they'll be like, hey, I know someone who's, you know, interning. That's, I've, I've stumbled into almost all of my extracurricular jobs that way. But if you're asking the question, can I can I teach with a master's degree? I think some of the community colleges may let you teach. Uh, even some universities may allow you to teach as a part-time instructor. Um, there are opportunities. You, you have to just look for them. I think I will eventually get my PhD. I was just asking more of like going from working in the field to getting back into academia. Yeah, but teaching when you are working as a part-time instructor in a community college will add to your resume when you apply for a PhD. Right. So. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, actually, I've heard a lot about uh, how it's important to go to conferences and talk to people and uh, grow our networks. But uh, the question for me is that how can reach that person? How can I start that uh, conversation? What kind of question I can ask? I mean, these these things is really important for me, and it's uh, I know it's important to talk to that people. I really want to talk, but I don't know how to start. So, if you can give us some tips for that. Typically, when I go to places, uh, I do this as a as a dean. You meet all kinds of people all the time, and you go to a new group, uh, just to wander in, say, "Hey, I'm uh, Raman." And uh, just shake hands. That's, that, that just breaks the ice and you start talking. And then say, you'll say what, what he is. And then you ask him, what do you do? And, and he, uh, if he's a professor, you already know him. You say that I've already followed your work. And I like what you do. And you can refer to a journal article or some thought that he has uh, put out in a journal article. That's how you start a conversation with the professor. With graduate students, you can just say, hey, where are you from? Which university? What are you doing? What's your project? So there are lots of ways of doing it. It all depends on if you already know who the person is, then you have a lot of matter. Already, you already have a lot of information that you could bring out in a conversation. But if you don't know the person is a stranger in a conference, just ask questions like, where are you from? Where did, what do you do? That's how I do it. Plus, but you cannot be shy about it. Plus, the other thing is, if they have a paper at that conference, make sure to go to that panel walk up to that person, ask a follow-up question. I was really interested in what you said here and there, just to get the conversation going. And that might, and then try to get the business card. I mean, this is the, always the thing. Well, I'd like to have a little bit more of a conversation with you about that. Is that, and usually, most faculty members will be more than happy to at least have a little bit of a conversation with you. Yeah, I would say too, I've noticed, um, in my first couple of years of conferences, it was all about presenting a paper and not having a heart attack when people ask you questions or argue with you. But there are all these other um, conferences have built-in social things, book exhibitors. Um, I've been on a few seminar panels with people huge in my field where everybody had a draft of a first idea and it was a, a conversation instead of a panel like this. Um, so I don't know what field you're in, but I think conferences do make an attempt to enable people to network, and um, that's a good place to start too, as opposed to um, approaching someone after a formal panel. That there are more informal things and um, happy hours and book promos and stuff that you could try to stalk people in. The usual tendency I have seen is people tend to go to the people they already know. 
you have to break away from that. Yeah, uh, you pointed out something interesting that if you have two conferences, one I go to places where I know people, one I don't go, I don't, I don't go to such conference. Always, even in a conference where you know people, you have to break away from that group and then go explore. Yeah, I also have mentioned that you can invite the person if you have presentation at a conference, you can invite the business for So I have a presentation, would you mind coming and uh, give me some advice? And also, but if you have paper published, you again pay attention to those people you cite, those scholars, and see if they are around the conference and the course them. Say, hey, I read your paper, great job, and the conversation starts. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question. Um, I just moved back to the United States a couple of years ago, and I have not been in this country for almost 18 years, and I have no Facebook. Definitely way over 25. I'm over 50, so I'm not in that realm. So I don't have a Facebook. I only have LinkedIn, LinkedIn, and um, a few other little things, but nothing important. And um, so there's nothing you can Google me for. So there, how do you uh, reach out that way? And also, um, um, as at my age, does that make a difference in sense of of because uh, I'm going back to school to get. Uh, other degrees in other fields, I'm cross uh, discipline uh, and changing my field, kind of. Um, so, well, I can give you one anecdote where they were brutally honest to me. I thought about getting a second PhD after my MBA had, had worked well, and Cornell actually had asked me if I want to stay on for. PhD in marketing, but I had that offer from McKinsey, so took that, and then two or three years later, I decided I should have taken that academic offer and tried to get back in and applied to a whole bunch of universities, and it totally depends. There were a couple who gave me a very serious look, and I had a guy at UCLA telling me to my face, I know you're over 35. By the time you're out of here, you're 40. We don't get enough publications out of you anymore that we invest in you for the next five years. They, they, they literally told me that, probably violating 16 university rules. <laughs> um, but it was like that hot, but others probably are not that critical. It depends where you are. Um, the Harvards and the Yales is, will be probably getting tough but there are 4,000 universities in this country. So there are, there are opportunities. Yeah, I would say um, you don't necessarily have to use Facebook for personal stuff. You yeah, can, I don't even have Yeah, but if you were to create one, you could you know, follow your department and get news from there, follow the GPSA and the university just to establish sort of an innocuous presence. I mean, you, you certainly don't have to post anything personal. And I mean, I, um, my Facebook is on like super lockdown. Nobody can see it, nobody can friend me because it's all personal stuff. I don't have a, a professional, I, and I got rid of it because um, it's too hard to make the distinction. But, but you can, I also know people who have nothing personal on it except things are associated with and promote job ads. So it's really how you want to use it. All right, question. So when it comes to applying for jobs, I've looked at some of the academic announcements, and they'll often have very, very specific research area or teaching area. How well do you have to fit that, especially if they're looking for something that's more on the new or novel area? Yeah, I'm just thinking back when I applied. Uh, I applied when it was serious downturn. I sent out 250 resumes, 250. I got five job interviews and made a couple of them and came to UNLV. So when I applied, actually I was, I was applying indiscriminately. I just didn't care because I needed a job. Job market was really terrible. So that, I'm not saying I'm advocating that, but, uh, but I think if, if you're related to that area in any way, I think I would, I would uh, send the resume in, but highlight something related to the area, plus something that you would bring additionally. Because you can say very specific areas, but the areas are all related anyway. If you say nanotechnology, 
could be so broad the way you interpret it. It could be from physics to chemistry to electrical engineering to mechanical engineering. So that, I think you should, if, if you have something you have done related to nanotechnology, I would highlight it as, hey, I have a journal article, so, so I would apply. Uh, even if it is related, I would say 20, 30, 50 percent I will apply. You never know because there may, may be something else people may see in your resume, they may, they may like it. I, actually with the academic jobs, the way I see it, people spend more than one minute on the resume because these are not CVs, it's probably several pages. Uh, so they may be, and we don't get thousands. We probably get in an engineering, probably will get 50 to 100. Uh, I had one situation where I had three job openings in computer engineering, I had totally 27 resumes. So then we are going to pour through them as deep as you want, right? You have three job offers to make. So, so I, I, I would worry, I'm not worry about it, but I, if it's a completely unrelated, I will not apply. If you have any relationship, any journal article, any teaching you have done related to that, I would apply. And it's a little bit of extra effort, uh, but you may hit it, right? You never know. And to follow up on that point, at least on the non-academic side, you're always, after you send it electronically, you can always contact human resources. And there's a person who's in charge of that particular job posting. You can talk to that person. Um, there's usually a hiring manager on the other side, and, and you can just request, <coughs> if it, like I said, non-academic, and, and maybe academic as well, if there's a search committee. Um, you know, I, I may not fit it perfectly, but highlight the things that you do, that you have done, and then you know, kind of really get that personal engagement because there is an electronic aspect to the whole hiring process, but maybe put a face to it and, and pick up the phone and make a call. That doesn't hurt as well. And they may tell you this is specific or maybe this is not as specific and give you more information than what's posted. I think in academic jobs are a lot more freedom though. Um, I would say it's not a skill based. The skill is only the researching skill and teaching skill. It can be applied in a lot of different so the area, the, the sub-discipline itself is not very, even though they advertise it that way, um, I, I would say that's a little bit more, more open compared to an industry. Another question. Uh, when you apply for a job in industry and uh, the job is perfect for you, uh, it completely fits with your expertise and your knowledge and your duty, but the only things that is, I mean, might be challenging is the job experience. They require us to have like three to five years job experience. But I do have only like three months or less than a year job experience. Uh, is it going to be disqualifying me for that job even if I am really fits with that position? I think I'd follow up that, you know, sometimes a three to five year mark, it's, it's that's sometimes what they say is standard for experience, but once again, reach out. doesn't hurt to apply. Um, sometimes that's the human resource aspect of it and not the actual need. Um, I think to play into what I said earlier, I think internships are becoming more and more as that entry ticket. Um, sometimes a three to five year is so that people know that you're ready to fit that position, but if you do an internship, uh, or even now there's, I know in industry there's fellowships where they uh, kind of pay you, um, maybe not at what the rate you would if you were in that particular job, but it's an ability for you to do that mock interview for you know, six to 12 months. And so it doesn't hurt, I, I would send it in. Once again, follow up with the, with the uh, HR, the, uh, the individual who's in charge of that job. Ask that they maybe, if you can speak to the hiring manager directly because and tell them your, your qualifications fit perfectly, you may not have the experience and then, you know, it's not usually hard and fast. You know, you want to have some experience, but, you know, it doesn't hurt to, su to submit that application. I, I have an anecdote, very recent anecdote. My recent PhD student, that's three months ago, he applied for a job. It said five to ten years experience. He's a fresh PhD. Um, he has had experience not related to the job uh, from past long time ago. He, I, he asked me, I said, apply. He applied, and they didn't have very many applications. They invited him, and... He did extremely well on the interview, we made it into a job. So, I, it's just a, yet another resume. So if you can spend a couple of hours polishing it and tweaking it and sending it in, I would do it. And I think I want to stress the HR element as well, that, that so many things are just on there because they're on there. I'm originally from Germany where it is legal to ask for an applicant's age. And so it is 
sometimes you read the, the, the ad and it's ridiculous. It's like you should be under 25, have a master's degree, and three to five years of experience in the field. Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> and so from that alone, you can see that there are a lot of things. This is just, well, they click on this one. No, we had that one in the last ad that worked well, so let's just put it in. But not, not everything is written in stone in an ad. Another one. So before I ask this, I'll just say I am optimistic. I'm just also a realist. So you're applying for jobs. Maybe you get some interviews, or maybe there just aren't that many openings. What do you do after you finish your PhD, but you didn't get a job that first year? What things should you look at, or what should you have as a backup plan? Keep publishing. Keep publishing, and it, and again, keep attending the conferences. And uh, if you can find a part-time teacher job. And then, are you, assuming you are looking for academic job, right? Yeah, uh, part-time teaching is always good because that adds to your resume. You, you don't want to show a big gap professionally a uh, year or two, it doesn't look good. Uh, so you, you definitely want to, if you can publish work, uh, tell the professor, hey, I want to work with you, continue to work with you. If you can pay me as a postdoc or something, pay me, otherwise I'll work with you. Just work. And getting a couple of more journal articles or conference papers under, under the belt is not bad. And teaching opportunities always are good. If you're looking for an academic job, having that experience classroom teaching is very, very, very important. People are going to look at that very positively, especially in engineering and sciences. And the other one is also Teach for America, like Habitat for Humanity, all of these things, and you just call it a gap year. You don't have to. Yeah. You don't have to tell people <laughs> that you took that gap year because you didn't get a job. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll share just anecdotally. I, I, when I, after I finished my PhD, I, I didn't think of these things deeply. So I, I remember attending a conference and having a conversation about these very issues, about how challenging the job market was, how few publications I had, relatively speaking, how I hadn't thought about getting teaching experience, which prompted by a conversation at a conference, I went out and taught an extension school class at UCLA while being a postdoc just to get a teaching experience. But I almost wanted to cry. It was so sad, <laughs> uh, like sort of digesting this stuff. But I think, uh, I think everyone in this room has the benefit of thinking of these things earlier in the process. So Elizabeth is a second year PhD student. You don't have to wait till you have your PhD and then say, why did I think of this stuff four years ago? Uh, you all have the opportunity to think about these things with advanced planning and put yourself in the best position for success, mindful of having maybe a plan B and C uh, as well lined up. But uh, in that regard, I think it's probably a good time to, to wrap up then. I, I commend all of you for coming here today to be a part of these discussions and to, to be thinking about these things. And I especially want to thank our, our panelists. I think terrific experiences and insights each of you is able to offer, and all of you with UNLV ties one way or another as well, uh, but we all appreciate you taking the time out of very busy schedules to be with us uh, today. So thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you.